Jesus Christ, it's Robert Ludlum's The Bourne Conspiracy. Now, this game really is an oddity. It was an expensive project, and it's essentially the movie tie-in game to 2002's summer blockbuster The Bourne Identity, but it came out a timely six years later on PS3 and 360, and Matt Damon didn't want to be in it. At the time, Damon was pretty vocal about disliking violent video games, and when he was eventually directly asked about the game, this is what he said. I lobbied hard not to make a first-person shooter game, but to make it more like Myst, which was a great, interesting puzzle you tried to solve. You know, to play with his amnesia or memory. They weren't interested, they made the game anyway without my likeness. Good on you Matt Damon, I didn't know you were a point and click fan. Um, I guess this discourse was with publisher Vivendi because the actual developers at High Moon Studios didn't interact with him at all and just assumed he was out because of something to do with violence, which they were right about I guess. So what we got was the normalest looking white guy action hero ever. Also I assume old mate Matthew Damon isn't up to speed with his gaming terms because this is actually a third person shooter rather than first person, and there's a massive emphasis on hand to hand combat that as well, and there's a driving mission too, but we'll get to that later. Think like Gears of War, but worse. It's a cover shooter, but it's one of those cover shooters that at times is just so clunky you wouldn't even want to use the cover system. Uh, while you have a gun out, the camera sits over your shoulder so the FOV is really low, and moving around feels really sluggish. There's no button to actually aim or zoom in, so it just kind of feels like you're always aiming. And the left trigger, which could be used to switch in and out of aiming over the shoulder, is just completely unbound unless you're in cover, where it will aim. To relieve this, sprinting pulls the camera back, or you can put your weapon away, which means holding down the switch weapon bumper for about a second, which is awkward. Moving with your gun away feels fine, but now if you get into a firefight you'll need to press a button to pull your weapon out. High Moon were annoyingly close to getting this right. All they had to do was put an aim over the shoulder button like normal third person shooters do. Or maybe they should have just made a first person shooter like Matt Damon thought. There's no grenades, there's no blind fire, there's not really any enemy variety, there's no jumping or even vaulting over cover, and you can only hold two weapons at once, one of which always has to be your pistol. It's a pretty standard shooter too in that it's very linear, you have a very very 2008-esque Bourne vision to show you where to go, there's collectible passports lying around, and there's bad stealth bits. There's not much decision making going on in the moment to moment gameplay because it's just so overly simple. Uh, to add to the sadness, enemies take far too many bullets, and it does that thing where bullets somehow do way more damage to close enemies and way less damage to far away enemies. At times I was entering entire clips into people and they just wouldn't die. Um, headshots are an instant kill though, so going for them is basically a must, and the shotgun kills extremely quickly, which makes it super satisfying, so I really enjoyed the game when I could use it. High Moon Studios' first game was actually a first person shooter. Uh, Dark Watch was a western gothic sci-fi thing which is a pretty interesting game that has a little cult following that came out in 2005, the same year Vivendi made a deal with the Robert Ludlum estate to get the rights for making Bourne video games. In January of 2006 it was announced that Vivendi acquired High Moon and sometime around this time they assigned them to make the Bourne Conspiracy. Hand to hand combat breaks up the shooting which feels much more in line with the Bourne brand because when I think of Jason Bourne action scenes, I rarely ever think of shootouts. These fights are initiated by getting close to an enemy whether they have a gun or not, so sometimes the game will take away your weapons so you'll have to participate in fist fights, and sometimes it'll send guys running at you without guns and if they get close you'll have to beat them up, or in shootouts if you just run out of ammo or just feel like beating someone up you can just run straight up to them and it'll disarm them and enter this fighting mode, which you weirdly can't run away from once you're in. I like how Bourne always gets the first hit on enemies when you engage, that feels very in character. Unfortunately these fights, just like the shootouts, are overly simplistic. You have a heavy attack, a light attack, and a block button which you hold to block everything. You need to combo these together to surprise the people you're fighting, but every combo is only three hits long. Enemies don't really telegraph their attack, so it just feels like random mashing and when you die you feel like it's the game's fault and when you win you're not really sure what you did right. As you fight you build up a meter which gives you up to three takedowns, which are exactly what they sound like. Press a button, take down a dude. If there's two or three dudes and you have enough takedowns, you'll do multiple at once but you need to do a quick time event. You can also use takedowns in shootouts which after pressing the takedown button is a quick time event that just one shots guys which I really like because it helps get around the fact that the enemies have so much health. As bland as this takedown system is conceptually, it's fun enough in practice because at 
least it gives the ultra simple gameplay another layer and you need to think a bit about when to spend takedowns. If you're near a wall or something in the environment, the takedowns will appropriately play out an animation with the environment, which is great. It's all window dressing to a shallow combat system, but it makes it feel like it has so much more oomph which it needs, and the amount of animations that play out is honestly pretty staggering. The developers brought in legendary Hollywood martial artist and stuntman Jeff Imada to choreograph the fights and mocap, which is cool because he worked on Supremacy and Ultimatum. And the takedown animations really are great. The environments are dense with stuff to interact with, like even in the shootouts I was impressed by how much destructibility there is in this game, like you can shoot out people's cover which is really cool. However the only way to enjoy this stuff during fist fights is through the takedown system. I think if this game had a grab button where you just throw people into this stuff that would have helped a lot and shown it off a lot better. Like the entire fighting system only uses one stick and four buttons. There's so much more room to add depth mechanically to this, but they just didn't which is a shame because it's such a massive part of the game. Game. One of the coolest examples of these environmental takedowns is when the game reenacts that famous Paris apartment fight scene from the film, where you actually stab the dude multiple times with a pen and stick it in his hand. This is one of the many hand-to-hand -hand boss fights this game has, which are a fun spectacle, but an exercise in frustration as you just need to hope that you don't take too much damage as you build up enough takedowns to beat them. It throws so many of these guys at you throughout the game and they're all just so so similar so it gets very tired, but this apartment fight is super similar to the one in the movie which I really really appreciate and I think Bourne fans would get a kick out of it too, as the game more or less tells the exact same story as the movie in its own weird way. And it is exceptionally weird, like the game opens before the events of the film where you're tracking down Wombosi who was the guy in the movie that Bourne was meant to kill but didn't because he saw his kids and got all empathetic and shit, but the thing is this is something Bourne remembers right at the end of the movie because it's a big reveal, but here you've got a whole mission of killing dudes leading up to it and you see it play out before the game catches up to where the movie begins. And when you do catch up, the pre-rendered cutscenes are basically shot-for-shot -shot remakes of scenes in the movie. They've condensed the dialogue down a lot to make them quick and efficient, but throughout the game there's just these scenes which are basically ripped straight from the movie but remade as game cutscenes, which makes that cognitive dissonance of Matt Damon not being in them that much worse. The US Embassy scene is here, the opening scene on the fishing boat is here, the confrontation with Treadstone is here, even the haircut love scene is here in its own awkward video game cutscene kind of way. Also throughout the game Boring Bourne is straight up wearing the same outfits that Matt Damon did. On top of this, the pre-rendered cutscenes are hideous. When the game transitions between cutscene and gameplay it's like getting stabbed by a pen. They're real grainy and seem to struggle so much with low light that everything that would be a bit dark is just black. It's, it's so unusually bad that I have to call it a stylistic choice, but as a stylistic choice it was a bad choice. What these bad cutscenes lead me to believe, and this is completely hypothetical, is that while this game was being conceived and developed, High Moon thought that they were actually going to get Matt Damon in for the likeness. Because think about it, it retells the movie in an eerily similar way without Damon, and the pre-rendered cutscenes which were contracted out to another studio look like they were just thrown together at the last minute. Maybe during development they were going to use scenes from the actual movie as the cutscenes which would have been interesting, but that's just speculation, I know the movie rights are kind of tricky to get. If they knew that they weren't going to get Damon during development, then why did they even retell the movie? And if I still haven't convinced you, then why did they get Franca Patente, sorry if I just butchered your name, who played Marie in the movie to voice Marie in the game, but then change her visual likeness in the game? While we're on this topic, why is the game called The Bourne Conspiracy and not The Bourne Identity The Game? There's no conspiracy, and they just obviously wanted a cool word like identity and supremacy. Maybe they should have just adapted the novel somehow because that would have been way more fitting and way more interesting and given them way more creative freedom. Or of course they could just tell an original Born story assuming they could get permission from the Ludlam estate. According to interviews the developers worked closely with the Ludlam estate but it certainly doesn't show in the final game so I gotta give that a big press X to doubt. What we got was ultra uncanny vibes from the lack of Damon alongside some of the most janky storytelling that I don't think would make any sense if you hadn't seen the movie because it's just so fast paced and jumpy. Throughout the game Born has flashbacks to past missions he's been on which gives the developers an easy excuse to pat out the game, but these flashbacks virtually don't relate in any way to what's going on in the current timeline and actually kind of ruin the intrigue of who Bourne is. I get that basically everyone playing this would have seen the movie, but again Matt Damon isn't here so you'd expect it to tell the story in its own way that's at least coherent. In these flashbacks some bad guy is set up and you shoot and fight your way to him before eventually taking him down in a repetitive boss battle. There's no intrigue to them and whenever one started it felt like the story's pacing slowed which was a bit of an eye roll. But to make up for it they often had some really entertaining set pieces like fighting
going on train tracks with trains flying past, or on a train itself, or in the back of a cargo plane, or in a museum. Mixed into the game are refreshingly normal places like apartments and houses and streets and airports, even though I think the game would have been much better if they didn't base it on the movie. As a fan of the movie, I did actually quite enjoy how they recreated a lot of the action from it. Along with the Paris apartment fight, we have things like the US Embassy scene, which starts and ends in the same places, but has been lengthened and ramped up to the extreme. Or the fight with the other assassin at the snow house has you blocking off windows and shooting explosives for cover from his sniper, which eventually culminates in a huge fist fight in a burning down barn, which is an interesting deviation from the movie. Also, this fight is on a countdown timer, which is something this game does a lot of, and I really like that. I know it's a cheap way of upping the intensity, but I'm a driver fan, so I love countdown timers, and it feels appropriately spy movie to have actual countdowns. Unfortunately, I never actually lost the game to a timer because they're all far too generous. The game also elaborates on the scene after Bourne's Treadstone encounter with a big shootout, and it even has its own quick time version of that wonderful bit where Bourne falls down a stairwell on a guy and shoots another guy. Because this is a game from 2008, it goes crazy with the quick time events. I found their use with the takedowns to be fine, but in cutscenes, it's just classic annoying quick time events, though. Usually they give you a generous amount of time, so it's not too bad. It's just annoying when you finish a tough section and put down the controller and then it throws a quick time at you because you forget, and then when you fail, it sets you way back because the checkpoints can sometimes be pretty bad. It was never too annoying, though, and the game had enough challenge on medium difficulty settings without being too frustrating. I did find the sniping quick time events to be completely ridiculous though. The game just aims for you and all you have to do is press the buttons that appear on the screen. I feel like actual sniping sections could have lended a refreshing hand to this game, but they wasted that opportunity entirely on these, which is really, really dumb. The iconic mini Paris escape scene is redone in the game as its only driving level. Where they were driving an old Austin Mini in the movie, here in the game they're driving a new Mini, which is a weird change, but I think Mini just wanted their branding in the game, and so did Mastercard apparently. Uh, this driving level is surprisingly fun and a welcome breath of fresh air. It's very simple, but it reminds me of those fun driving bits in EA's 007 games. It has semi-open-ish areas mixed with linear bits and very scripted bits and destructible stuff everywhere and timers are involved. It's all very exciting and I wish there was more than one driving mission in this game. It's, it's weird that this is the only time they use these mechanics. The only thing it's really missing though is Paul Oakenfold's Ready Steady Go. But Paul Oakenfold did actually do the soundtrack to this game, adding to the list of people from the movie movies who worked on this, and he did a good enough job. If only there was a certain actor from the movies in this, um. The sound design overall is really, really good, and Oakenfold even collaborated with CeeLo Green of all people to make a song for this game, which resulted in a very strange and surreal music video. Um, a link is in the description. It kind of highlights how much money Vivendi poured into this project, and the sort of expensive feel of this game really shows throughout. Running on a modified Unreal 3, I found the environmental variety and detail to be very high quality, especially for a 2008 game. Couple this with all the destructibility and it still impressed me some 11 years later. Obviously it's dated, but the game moves forward fast enough that it doesn't ever really tire of one location. Coming in at about 5 hours long, despite the overly simple gameplay, I actually quite enjoyed blasting through this game from start to finish and just seeing all the things it did and the places it went and just the way it adapted everything. The game's short length was the main criticism from reviewers at the time, which I guess is fair enough because this was a full priced release with no multiplayer, but upon reflection, if you like shorter games like I do, then this may well be worth a pickup. It's very dodgy in a lot of ways, but it's overshadowed by how fast and flashy it is so that you're never really that bored of it. I know I just complained about this game for like this whole review, but like it's it's in that same tier that like Homefront is, or Quantum of Solace, or Kane and Lynch 2, or 007 Bloodstone, or the, the Order 1886, in that it's just an ultra short, decent, simple time that's very flashy and pretty enjoyable, but also kind of bad at the same time. If you like those short action games, or if you like the Bourne identity, then this will probably be a fun time for you, just don't expect too much. I just wish that Matt Damon was in it. I, I love that him pulling out really through a curveball on the entire project. At the same time though, I would have liked to see a lot more from a Bourne game. Matt Damon was actually kind of right in that just making a shooter is kind of a boring idea for Bourne. He was onto something in that there's a lot more to Jason Bourne the character than just the action bits, and if we saw a game that somehow capitalizes on this, and is somehow more of a puzzler, I think that would have been way more interesting. Like, maybe instead of taking inspiration from stuff like Bond games and Call of Duty and Gears of War, they could have just looked closer to something like, like Hitman or Splinter Cell maybe? This game just doesn't do enough to make you feel like Bourne. It doesn't do enough to sort of stand out on its own, and there's kind of a reason it's so forgotten. 
After the Activision Vivendi merger, High Moon Studios would make a well-liked trilogy of Transformers games before making what's probably their most famous game with Deadpool in 2013, and then finally Activision fired 40 of their employees and they got consumed into the Call of Duty slash Destiny support team depression. How cool are Activision? And with that, we wrap up our look at the Bourne Conspiracy. Now for the first time ever, I want to thank all my patrons, including all these guys on the screen wherever they are right now, and especially including Devin Grandel, Mrs. Minimi, uh, Homer821, Labcat, Lucas Raysevic, Magnus Icomo Stavik, Mattis Bayus, May Arise, or May Arise, uh, Review Disney Planes, The Fable Historian, Trixie Emerson, and Writing on Games. You all are legendary. Everyone who supports, thank you so much. Everyone who just watches in general, thank you so much. Thanks for subscribing, thanks for liking. Hope you enjoyed the video, and um, take it easy.